Okay, it's going to be a review of WrestleMania 7. show took place on March 24th, 1991. Uh, easily one of the most controversial WrestleManias, and it's one of my favorites as well. You know, this is the first pay-per-view I ever ordered. Um, so obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, probably going to like the show a lot more than most people. Um, but yeah, a lot to talk about in terms of uh, the venue and the pay-per-view and the ticket sales. So... Um, you know, our, our country was at war. You know, uh, Saddam Hussein in Iraq had uh, invaded Kuwait. And, you know, we were in the midst of the uh, Persian Gulf War, you know, leading up to WrestleMania 7. And, uh, you know, with that going on, they decided to turn Sergeant Slaughter heel. And he was going to play an Iraqi sympathizer to be the villain, you know, and have Hulk Hogan be the, uh, you know, All-American. The great way to cash in on Hogan is the All-American hero. So you definitely get it from that perspective. But, you know, I, I think the combination of just a lot of different things, you know, the, the Super Bowl that year had to have extra security. Apparently the NFL and, you know, they, they had to spend, uh, you know, a couple of million, you know, millions and millions of dollars on just extra security to get that game, you know, finished. You know, it's one of the best Super Bowls of all time, you know, with the Giants and the Bills and, you know, Whitney Houston's performance was was mind blowing. But the bottom line, bottom line is they, they spent a lot of money just to get that, uh, you know, Super Bowl in the books. So um, the WWF was just going to have to spend way too much money uh, to run the show at the uh, Coliseum, the Los Angeles uh, Coliseum, which they beautifully promoted at WrestleMania six. They, you know. Possibly we're going to get 105,000 in attendance, but, you know, they just decided, you know, in the build up to WrestleMania that they were just going to run at the, uh, you know, Los the L.A. Sports Arena, which is where the Clippers play. So they go from having potentially 105,000 to about 16,000 in attendance. Melter's only saying reported here that only 10,000 paid in attendance. So, yeah, that's uh, that's quite the drop off. And um I'm going to assume it's probably just a combination of the WWF just not wanting to spend all that money on security. And, you know, ticket sales probably weren't that good because I think a lot of people just thought it was a risky situation to be in, especially when it's well documented that Sergeant Slaughter and the WWF was getting death threats, bomb threats, you know, from all sorts of areas, probably from fans and probably from, you know, foreigners as well. So, um, the other controversial thing about the show is you, you hear Gorilla Monsoon throughout the whole show saying this is the largest pay-per-view audience uh, in the history of pay-per-view. But when you look at the numbers, it's like only 400,000. So it doesn't do as good as WrestleMania 5 and WrestleMania 6. And then, you know, it doesn't even do as good as a show like WrestleMania 10, which I think WrestleMania 10 is 420,000. Um, so, you know, you learn that they were broadcasting this to, you know, maybe troops or, you know, people around the world on a live uh, radio feed. So I, I guess that's what they meant by, you know, biggest broadcast in pay-per-view history was, you know, there was there was some sort of free um, service that it was being broadcasted over. But in terms of people actually ordering the pay-per-view, it's actually uh, not an accurate number. So, um so, yeah, you know, first pay-per-view I ever ordered on, on a Palm Sunday. I, I, I do think this. I think the positive side effect of not having it in the Coliseum, it, it felt exclusive. It, it really did feel like you had, you know, a uh, a smaller arena just full of just uh, diehard fans. I, I think from, you know, start to finish, it's, it's, it's probably one of the best, um, you know, crowd reactions I think a WrestleMania ever gotten. Uh, without a doubt. So, uh, so let's get right down to it. First match of the of the night. And um, you know what? Actually, before we get down to the matches, I got to point out, I love the theme for this WrestleMania. I thought that WrestleMania song. I think it actually started with WrestleMania six, and WrestleMania five, six, and seven. They all had Vince doing the intros, and it just seemed like each and every one got better. The Mega Powers was cool, and then the the Hogan and uh, Warrior one with the two most powerful forces in the galaxy explode. I thought that was a cool one. And this one was even better. Now, just the way Vince said, World Wrestling Federation Champion, Sergeant Slaughter, the immortal Hulk Hogan. Vince just had an unparalleled amount of passion and energy for the product that just no one else had. So, uh, and yeah, that's the best way to do it. You want to do something right, you got to do it yourself. It's his company, so no one's going to know how much passion to put into it other than Vince. So yeah, these Vince McMahon... 
uh, opening promos were gold, in my opinion, and I, th- I thought this was the best one. Just wanted to make that point uh, uh, before we get into the show. Okay, so we start off the show with a bang. We got the Rockers, Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty, taking on Haku and Barbarian of the Heenan family. As, uh, you know, there's a rocker promo before the show where they, they call themselves uh, tag team specialists and they're kind of mocking uh, Bobby Heenan as well. But, yeah, I, I thought this was cool. I, I thought this was actually the best match the Rockers had at WrestleMania up to this point. Um, really a a sign of uh, good things to come. You, you got this smaller, younger, athletic uh, Rockers going over. You know, the Barbarian's a big guy. You know, he's, he, he's a... Um, He's a huge guy, you know, muscle-bound guy. And, and for Sean and Marty to get a victory over a guy like him and another bigger guy in Haku, it just um, it was just a sign of good things to come. I, I thought the match had a lot of energy. There were some really hot tags. Uh, you know, Sean and Marty did some beautiful double-team moves. The um, Marty doing the clothesline, and, and, and that, that blended in beautifully to Sean doing a, a sunset flip into a pinning predicament. That came off great. Lots of really nice drop kicks. Sean does a beautiful uh, cross body off the top rope uh, to get the pinfall. And, uh, you know, Sean's reaction was just kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm ready. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to, to break out and, and be something big part, you know, be a part of something bigger and better uh, down the road. That's, that's the body language that I think Sean really kind of displayed here. And, uh, yeah, good opener. I, I thought this was... I thought this was probably the best WrestleMania opener up to that point and uh, uh, definitely the best match that the Rockers had at at WrestleMania. Um, And, uh, yeah, and that's the Rockers' last WrestleMania match as Shawn would actually open up WrestleMania 8 as a uh, singles guy. Okay, so next up we got the Texas Tornado, uh, Kerry Von Erie, uh, taking on uh, Dino Bravo with Jimmy Hart. Okay, so this is Dino Bravo's, uh, you know, He's kind of winding down at this point. He didn't have a very happy ending to his uh, uh, situation here. And neither did the Texas Tornado. But, you know, uh, Tornado makes really, really quick work of of Dino. This is, um, you know, one of the shorter things on the show. The ending almost looks like Tornado did a variation of a Superman punch, kind of a a twirling discus, um, you know, wind up punch uh, to get the victory over Dino Bravo, but uh, but yeah, and then we would just move on from there. Next up, we got the British Bulldog uh, taking on the Warlord with Slick, and uh, I I thought this was good stuff. You know, they they were really uh, putting over the Warlord's um, you know master lock, you know, f- uh, full Nelson uh, submission hold here to see if uh, Bulldog could break it. Bulldog actually did break it, did a beautiful counter to it. There were some really really nice transitions out of the running power slam and bulldog is able to actually counter warlords and do his own running power slam to put him away i thought this was good stuff you know i i, th- I thought out of anything on the show uh this is one of the few matches that really I, I i thought overachieved just didn't didn't expect much from these guys but they had a really entertaining fast-paced match considering how much you know muscle and mass uh both guys are carrying okay so next up we got the tag team title match, you got the Hart Foundation taking on the Nasty Boys uh, for, the, for the tag team titles. You got Jimmy Hart out there with the Nasties. And uh, yeah, this is good stuff. I, I, I thought it was uh, one of the best matches on the show. Um, you know, just like the Rockers, I, I thought Hart Foundation had their best WrestleMania match here uh, against the Nasty Boys. Um, you know, Nasties d- did a, a lot of, you know, heat segments where they actually have, um, you know, Brett in the uh, Camel Clutch. You know, Brett did some beautiful counters out of the Camel Clutch. And uh, but yeah, but good action, good tags, just uh, a nice little old school match. Crowd was insanely hot uh, for the Hart Foundation, including... Home Alone boy, uh, Macaulay Culkin out there. You know, the Nasties actually get the uh, the cheap victory with the Jimmy Hart megaphone. But, uh, yeah, I, I thought it was a good match, though. I, I, I thought it was something that needed to be done. You know, this kind of gave Brett an out to finally get a chance to become a singles wrestler again. Apparently, they tried to split Anvil 
and bred up after WrestleMania four. It you know neither guy was able to get over on their own, so they they reformed the Hart Foundation. But this time, Bret even said in his documentary that he was really ready for it, and uh, he wasn't going to let himself down. But yeah, I, I, this was a great way to, for the Hart Foundation to go out. I, I thought it was definitely one of the better things on the night. And uh, and we move on from there. Next up, we got the blindfold match. We got Jake the Snake Roberts taking on uh, Rick the Model Martell. I thought this was good stuff. You know, the blindfold thing here, I thought it was really memorable. I, I don't think anyone, Jake is the ideal guy for this match. I, I thought he really made it work. The storyline definitely called for it to be a blindfold match because the, the model had like this, um, you know, like a, you know, cologne spray, perfume spray, and he actually called it arrogance. And he actually uh, sprayed Jake with it on, I believe it was the Brother Love show. So Jake is really selling it. He's got like, you know, his eye looks like it's uh, all messed up. You know, you don't even see the pupil. Uh, yeah, so, you know, that that really made sense to have it be a uh, a blindfold match. And it, it was definitely memorable. First time you've ever seen it. I believe at the Slam Dunk Contest uh, the month before, D. Brown from the Celtics actually won it by covering up his... Um, his his eyes just with his hand so maybe they got the idea from that but the storyline just just seemed like they had the idea from the start ever since survivor series and it was cool you know jake really kind of you know used the crowd to his advantage and you know jake's psychology was just you know good here he kind of knew you know exactly how to get the most out of it and uh you know the, the fans were into it and uh you know he was able to hit the ddt and <laughs> And slowly but surely, he, he eventually he found Rick and uh, and pinned him. I thought it was cool. You know, this easily could have been a disaster. I think if you did it with the wrong guy, I do remember in TNA, I believe it was uh, Chris Harris and James Storm tried to do one at I believe it was Lockdown, and it got it actually got a fire Russo chant. So yeah, that just goes to show you that it, it wasn't that easy to pull off. Okay, next up we got the historic, one of the most important WrestleMania matches of all time. The match really isn't anything special, but from a historical standpoint, it's Undertaker taking on uh, Jimmy Superfly's Snooka. This is not Snooka in his prime. This is kind of Snooka's last hurrah in terms of WWF and WrestleMania, you know, big matches. This is pretty much the end of it. But yeah, when Taker comes out there with uh, Paul Bear, you almost forget how, how many kids were like uh, afraid of the Undertaker. They just have these shots of kids just looking scared. As Taker comes out to the ring, I thought Taker looked good. You know, the, the Taker's move set was very controlled by Vince at the time. It seemed like I thought the running lariat in midair looked great. He actually did hit the tombstone. Snook had got some offense in, but it was just it just wasn't that effective. Really, maybe a couple of chops and elbow blows, but nothing really fancy. And uh, Taker actually wins with the tombstone, makes quick work of the superfly, and uh, the streak starts at the time. There wasn't like any, you know, long-term plan of, oh, we need to keep this guy undefeated at WrestleMania. I just think with Taker, you had a very valuable gimmick, a very valuable performer, and uh, you weren't going to have him lose unless it was to a, a very valuable uh, opponent. And, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I think people forget about Taker is because he was never really the guy, he never was really like forced into a situation where he had to lose, at least within like the first 10 WrestleManias. Um, and we move on to the next match. We got the match of the night. We got the Ultimate Warrior taking on Macho Man Randy Savage with Queen Sherry. This is actually a retirement match. <sighs> wow. Arguably the best match of 1991. Um, you know, you could argue that it's it's just as good as Warriors match at WrestleMania 6. Uh, they built this up beautifully at the Royal Rumble. Uh, I thought the scepter shot, and, and some of the shots where Savage just came out of nowhere at the Royal Rumble, uh, the screw Warrior out of the belt because Warrior didn't want to give him the title shot. It was, it was just uh, very, very well done. Um, you could make the argument that, you know, maybe the show would have done better had you had Ultimate Warrior stay champion and compete in the main event. I think a lot of people kind of underestimate how hot he was at the time. And uh, maybe that had, had to do with maybe the slow ticket sales. Maybe after they, because the Royal Rumble actually got a better buy rate than WrestleMania. That's what, that's what I'm hearing now. Like, you know, the Royal Rumble actually did, a be, did better business than, uh, than WrestleMania 7 did. And Warrior was champion going into that show. So 
you decide if Warrior, you know, deserved to main event WrestleMania 7 or not. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot to talk about here in terms of Warrior's uh, ego, demeanor, where his, where his mind was at the time. It seems to me like the situation was, you know, they're taking the belt off of Warrior, but, you know, Vince is really famous for, you know, I'll take care of you, I'll, I'll take care of you. So it sounds to me like, like Vince was going to promise Warrior a certain amount of money and maybe when WrestleMania 7 didn't do as well, he didn't get exactly what he was hoping for. So um, that's just something to think about in terms of the Ultimate Warriors mind, mind state. But uh, but yeah, the most important thing here is just the match. I, I thought Savage and Warrior were, were great here. You know, Warrior actually wears um, this fancy uh, coat out to the ring and, and his trunk's actually on the back of it. He has the WWF title and it says much more important than this. So there's a couple of, a couple of different ways you can look at it. You know, that's kind of a slap in the face to a championship. And it kind of just shows you how, you know, the, the Vince had really created like a mon a ego maniacal monster in, in the ultimate warrior, you know, when, you know, but you know, Vince shot himself in the foot, you know, when, when he promoted WrestleMania six, he called warrior and Hogan, the two most dominant forces in the galaxy. So when you, when you constantly tell somebody that they're eventually, they're going to believe it. And, you know, I'm sure warrior thought he deserved to get the WrestleMania payoff and, and compete for the championship, uh, in the main event. So, but at the same time, you could also argue that he was doing his job and making, you know, because his career was on the line, he had to make it, uh, you know, seem important, but you know, the, the Rick Rude thing is kind of comical, too, because that was kind of Rick Rude's uh, gimmick to, to, to kind of spray paint or, or paint, you know, his opponent's uh, stuff on, on the tights. But but yeah, man, uh, the, the, the match was definitely great, though, Warrior and Savage. It was just very well executed. Um, you know, they, they, they had a lot of time out there to let it unfold. I think this is like one of the first matches where you saw... You know, just, you know, finish after finish with, you know, Macho Man doing the five uh, elbow drops, you know, Savage actually kicking out of the, what did he kick out of it? You know, Savage actually kicked out of the Warriors uh, splash, which was the finish for WrestleMania six. Then you had the whole situation with Warrior just like talking to the heavens or, or talking to uh, the gods above to, you know, kind of asking them, is this really my destiny? And, you know, Warrior actually turns things around with the punch to the gut after Savage is going to do the double axe handle off the top rope. So that was a really cool spot. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was just a roller coaster of a ride, man. I thought both guys were in great shape. Warrior was in such good shape here. that, And he, he had such a cockiness about him that it almost kind of gave him like that attitude error, like cool factor. I don't know if anyone really ever noticed that. But uh, but yeah, really, really cool match. Um it, it sounds to me like it was Savage's idea to have Warrior just kind of step on him uh, for the pinfall. And, uh, you know, the, it's, it's, you know, at first you kind of think, man, that's kind of disrespectful. You're disrespectful, disrespecting a legend uh, like Randy Savage. But it, it kind of worked, though. Like when you look at the aftermath and, and how this, you know, WrestleMania moment was going to unfold with Savage and Elizabeth, you kind of want to make Savage out to be, you know, that sympathetic, you know, figure. You kind of like, like piss on him while he's down. So actually, I think it kind of worked, especially when you look back on it. So after the match was over, Sherry's like kicking him, you know, calling him a loser. And then all of a sudden, Elizabeth comes out of the crowd and makes a save, saves the man that she loves. And you get, I'm going to say it right now, this is the greatest WrestleMania moment of all time, not involving like a title change or a, um, you know, a WrestleMania main event for a title. You know, when, when we're talking about WrestleMania moments, not involving, uh, you know, a, a title change, I, I, I would definitely say this, this is probably my favorite moment. Uh, Elizabeth in another great moment. You know, I, I would actually say the moment actually exceeds the WrestleMania four uh, tournament win for Randy Savage. I mean, you got, you got grown women, women in the crowd, you know, shedding tears, not just tears, but like buckets of tears just coming down that one girl's face. And they still use that, that girl's reaction now. You have multiple women just crying in the crowd. Uh, yeah, it was just, it was just a great moment to see, you know, Macho Man and, and Elizabeth reunited. You know, you got the Macho Man face turn. You know, Macho Man was going to take time off. And, but ultimately, they were, this was going to lead to the match made in heaven where they get married. So yeah, it was it was definitely a great moment. But what's funny is Savage is the one that 
that's competing for the championship at WrestleMania eight while the ultimate warrior is nowhere to be found. And it's, it's almost like he got the return of the fake ultimate warrior at WrestleMania eight, but it's just funny how warrior actually saves his career here and uh, wins the match. But ultimately, you know, warrior is the one that's, you know, kind of exiled uh, after SummerSlam, but that's, that's definitely another story, but yeah, great WrestleMania match. Uh, definitely stole the show. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty much just as good as, if not on the same level as the uh, WrestleMania six main event. Okay, yeah, really hard to follow that. So you, you kind of had an intermission here with a lot of the celebrities and a lot of backstage stuff. So next up, we got Demolition taking on Tenryu and uh, Koji Katayo. Um, so Demolition is actually reunited with Mr. Fuji. This version of Demolition is actually Smash uh, and Crush. Um, very, very short match here. I, I believe Tenryu uh, from Japan was trying to establish his own independent uh, wrestling promotion in Japan, and he was trying to uh, you know, make a name for himself by competing at WrestleMania. Uh, yeah, I, I thought Tenryu looked good here. The match was a little bit short, but you could definitely see that Tenryu is definitely you know, something to see. Uh, the other guy, Katayo, apparently he was a former sumo wrestler, tried to kind of embarrass Earthquake when they did do a show over in Japan a couple months later. But yeah, I, I I thought this was really cool, actually. Uh, you know, the, to see the the uh, you know the, the variety here of, of seeing Japanese talent compete at a WrestleMania that was really cool. And you know, the, the association with Fuji, you know, maybe Fuji has something to do with the context here. I'm not sure, but you know, in, in terms of de this version of Demolition, Demolition was something that was hot. You know, in the '80s, obviously they were really inspired by you know a lot of bands like Kiss that that came through in the '80s. But at, at this point. You know, they, they were kind of uh, being demoted and kind of on the way out. As you see it here, but, you know, just putting Crush as a substitute in that spot, it kind of, you know, diminishes the, the credibility of them. But, but yeah, move on to the next match. we got Big Boss Man uh, taking on Mr. Perfect uh, with Bobby Heaton for the, uh, the Intercontinental Championship. So Mr. Perfect is the IC champion and uh, takes on Boss Man. Yeah, this was really good stuff. This was definitely one of the top five matches of the night. Um, I would, I would say this. Yeah. Boss man is a baby face here. They, they were trying really hard to, you know, get boss man to transition as, um, you know, the, the, the policeman to appeal to kids. But at the same time, you know, he, he was losing weight and, um, you know, his wrestling was just getting better and better. And, and he, the perfect was the perfect guy. Uh, to showcase, um, you know, how good he was. I mean, they did some really, really nice counters to the perfect plex. Bossman actually small counter, small packages the perfect plex. And uh, perfect is just bumping like a bitch here. I mean, Shawn Michaels really kind of took the overselling thing to another level, especially when you look at the Hogan match. But really, like, what I think really inspired the way Shawn would eventually sell, it was definitely perfect. I thought perfect was great here. He applied some really, really... You know, unique submission holes, the abdominal stretch. I, I thought everything was going well here. Uh, the The problem is you had Andre interfere. So Andre makes his last WrestleMania appearance. Then you got the Heenan family of Barbarian and Haku interfering. So the match is actually a disqualification. But hey, you know, Perfect was a great Intercontinental Champion. Uh, you didn't want to drop it to Big Boss Man. You know, eventually he was going to drop it to Brett. So you keep perfect looking strong and plus boss man is going to have, you know, some, some really, really interesting feuds, uh, in the coming year. So you, you kind of protect him as well, even though you don't give him, I, I don't know, big boss man with the intercontinental championship at that time, you rather keep it on guys like perfect Sean bulldog, Michaels, you know, those are the guys you think of for the IC title, not necessarily boss man. You could, you could put boss man in something a little bit more, you know, theatrical and get away with it. Like, Boss Man versus the Mountie. Okay, next up we got Earthquake uh, taking on Greg Valentine. Okay, so Valentine to turn face uh, breaks away from uh, you know Jimmy Hart and and the uh, the Honky Tonk Man and all those guys. So Valentine gets a lot of offense in in the beginning, but then Earthquake uh, turns things around and basically squashes uh, Valentine with the finish. Very very short. Earthquake makes quick work of uh, Valentine. You, you got to remember, Quake Earthquake actually was the um, the runner up in the Royal Rumble, um, so you definitely understand why he went over in that fashion. Okay, so next up we got Legion of Doom, Hawk and Animal actually taking on Power and Glory, Paul Roman and Hercules. This is a uh, vintage squash match for Legion of Doom as they hit the Doomsday device within a minute. 
So the squash matches are starting to pile up here, and you're just saying to yourself, all right, maybe the WrestleMania is kind of losing some momentum here. Next up, we got Virgil with Roddy Piper. I don't know why Piper did this. So Piper was actually in a, in a motorcycle accident, so he was actually, you know, really kind of doing the uh, Mickey thing with Virgil, really kind of trying to, you know, help Virgil out and uh, taking on Ted DiBiase, the, the million-dollar man here. So, you know, Virgil finally... Uh, got tired of taking all of DiBiase's shit and, and turned on him at the Royal Rumble, which is very well done. But I'll tell you what, guys, I don't think they followed it that well here. I thought the SummerSlam match was a lot better. Uh, Virgil looked a little bit weird here. You know, you, you could definitely tell he's he's very much inspired by um, a lot of boxers. He, for some reason, he, he reminded me of a cross between Orlando Jordan and the Shane McMahon with the Juke and Njive. The punches just didn't come off great. I, I, I really didn't care for the match. Um... You know, Piper is actually at ringside. That forced uh, uh, DiBiase to get counted out. And, uh, yeah, and then they did some, uh, the, the match kind of ends with Virgil and um, Roddy Piper just kind of celebrating. But uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure as, as to why Piper was so pro-Virgil. Maybe he was trying to make up for the fact that he felt guilty about what he did with Bad News Brown at WrestleMania 6. That's the only thing I could think of. But, you know, Piper was injured, so they had to, they had to do something on this show. But, yeah, I, I would definitely say the DiBiase-Virgil stuff uh, at SummerSlam, the actual match was, was a lot better than this for, from what I remember. Okay, so next up we got the Mountie. Doing shades of Bill Goldberg with uh, defeating Tino Santana with the help of Jimmy Hart with a cattle prod. And uh, yeah, so uh, it wasn't Scott Hall that used it first on Goldberg. It was actually J Jimmy Hart uh, using it on Tito Santana in a very, very short match. As we transition to the main event, we got Sergeant Slaughter uh, defending the WWF Championship um, against Hulk Hogan. So yeah, I, I, I've stated plenty of times. I thought I thought Slaughter was um, was great as a heel. The original plan was not Slaughter though. The, like when in the summer of 1990, August 2nd to be exact, when they they started having the situation in the Persian in the Persian Gulf with uh, you know Iraq and and Kuwait. The original plan was actually supposed to be tugboat or typhoon, whatever you want to call him. Apparently, he was supposed to turn on Hogan. And he was going to be like a, uh, you know, his own version of the Sheik, where they dress him up like the like the Sheik or whatever. That would have been horrible. Uh, yeah, think about Hulk Hogan and, and Typhoon or Tugboat at WrestleMania Seven, a hundred thousand people. Uh, it, it just it just wasn't going to happen. I, I think Slaughter was definitely a more effective heel. Um, you know, I, I'll tell you what. I, I think this definitely worked. Um, you know, you, you you could definitely argue that you know the the situation was in bad taste. Uh, you're trying to um, you know you, you're turning Sergeant Slaughter heel um, because of this whole war thing, and you're, you're trying to use the war to benefit the company. So some people look at it like that. When I was a kid, I thought it was real, so I, it, it worked to me. But when you're appealing to kids. You know, at the time, you know, like I loved uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So to see the turtles go up against Shredder, or to see Batman go up against the Joker, or Superman to go up against Nuclear Man. You know, kids love good versus evil, which is something WrestleMania Six didn't necessarily offer. So I, I thought, in some ways, when especially when you got that many kids watching the product, it, it was definitely a smart move. Like I hated Slaughter. I hated the fact that he beat, uh, you know, the Ultimate Warrior. So you wanted to see Warrior get his revenge on Savage. And you wanted to see Slaughter go down at the hands of Hulkamania. So, you know, when you saw Slaughter, Slaughter did not burn the American flag. I think they, they, they thought about it, but they thought better of it. So instead, he, he burned it. Hulk Hogan, Hulk Rules jersey. And it still got a great amount of heat. But, you know, you just, you know, Slaughter did a great job. You know, it was effective. He was getting, you know, death threats and bomb threats. Um, because he was so good, you know, he he was really convincing. I'm sure there was a lot of people that were adults that that actually did buy into it. So he definitely had a good versus evil feel here. Um, so in terms of the actual match, I thought it was good. I I, I thought it was really really good. You know, I, I don't I wouldn't say it's quite as good as um, you know Hogan's previous WrestleMania main events against Savage or Warrior. But I would say it's a lot better than matches uh, like uh, Hogan versus Sid. I would even say it's, from what I remember, I, I would even say it's better than Hogan versus uh, uh, Bundy 
without a doubt. So I, I, I think it's a solid WrestleMania main event. I, I, I thought it was, um, I thought it was very well done, and uh, it, you know, felt like good versus evil. You know, Hogan actually uh, bled here, so this is not the only only time Hogan bled. Um, I'm trying to think of, what, I think he bled against Bundy. And, um, you know, obviously he bled against Vince McMahon, but, you know, the, the blood really added a lot here. You know, people always think about, you know, Austin at WrestleMania against Brett and, and how effective the blood was. But, you know, you know, give Hogan credit. This is the first time where it really, you know, worked in a, um, you know, in a WrestleMania main event and, and was effective. I, I thought the flag spot was really creative. I thought it was something different and I thought it just... You know, in 1991, Hogan just, he still had a lot of uh, juice left. And I, I, I really feel like this is the last glimpse of prime Hogan. And, you know, him ripping up the uh, the Iraqi flag and him, you know, putting Slaughter away. It was kind of like, you know, everybody went home happy. You know, Marla Maples was the uh, special ring announcer. You know, Trump was actually out there once again. Alex Trebek. Regis was on commentary here. Everybody seemed to go home happy. You know, I think it was Gorilla after the match is over. It's like, you know, Slaughter, Slaughter's reign is over and the war is over. And now we can move on. It just, it felt like a great WrestleMania moment. I, 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 I think it was, um, you know, it was just, just, just a beautiful glimpse of good prevailing over evil. That's all I can really say about it. I mean, do I, do I think the, do I think it's um, a spectacular performance from Slaughter? No. Do, do I like the fact that, you know, Slaughter was just basically taken out of retirement and just given the title just to play a character? Part of it I don't really like, you know, because it kind of kills the competitive side of wrestling. But I thought it really made for a good story. So I'll, I'll just kind of end it like that. And uh, yeah, um, I, w I would definitely say one of, one of the more memorable, uh, you know, Hogan main events uh, in WrestleMania history. And uh, Hogan's always been very uh, complimentary of Sergeant Slaughter for his performance. I, I remember he was he was very happy with it. He, he, he really thought Slaughter really adjusted and uh, was really, really, you know, a pleasant surprise uh, to work with. So, yeah, Ho Hogan's actually a huge fan uh, of this main event. So, yeah, just a... Um, you know, from a visual standpoint, I, th I thought it was very, very satisfying. So, yeah, that's WrestleMania 7. Overall, I would say this is one of the better WrestleManias of uh, of the first decade. Um, I, I mean, there's what really hurts the show is there's just a, an enormous amount of squash matches, an enormous amount of filler. Um, but you know, there's, there's some really, really great stuff too. I, I think warrior and savage is, is definitely one of the best WrestleMania matches, uh, of the first 10 WrestleManias. I think the rockers and the, um, the rockers match and the, uh, the heart foundation match were really, really good stuff. I, I think British bulldog and warlord is, is got to go down. It's one of the more underrated WrestleMania matches. I think Jake and Rick Martel, the blindfold match was definitely something unique, something special. You got the start of the Undertaker's streak. Uh, you, you got probably one of the better Intercontinental Championship matches, even though it ended in a DQ. With uh, you know, you, you still got to see Andre out there, and I thought the actual work between Bossman and Perfect was just very well done. And um, you know, you know, the, you definitely had a little, a lot more stories and, and, and a lot more stuff that was built up on this show. Like Virgil and DiBiase had a great build as well. Um, and then, yeah, I, th I think Hogan and Slaughter was definitely, it, it's, it's definitely a solid WrestleMania main event. It's, it's not one of the worst. It's not one of the better ones, but it's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty satisfying for the, for that time. And, uh, that's WrestleMania seven. Hope you guys enjoyed the review and I'm out. All right.